Welcome to the School of Theology and Prayer at the Church of the Ascension of St. Agnes in Washington, DC. I'm Sarah Coakley, assisting priest and theologian in residence here. And I'm delighted to welcome you this morning to the third in a four part series of webinars that we're holding this season on prayer in the time of pandemic and social unrest. The topic for today is the problem of negative or afflictive thoughts in prayer. And I've invited today one of my friends um, in the realm of academic theology, but also in spiritual theology, Father Martin Laird. Welcome, Martin. Um, he is an Augustinian friar and professor of early Christian studies at Villanova University in Philadelphia. He has written a host of books and articles in patristic theology and Christian contemplative life. His doctorate and first book was on the thought of Gregory of Nyssa in the late fourth century, but he has a special interest in someone called Evagrius Ponticus, whom we're going to hear about at some length today, who's also a fourth century uh, monastic writer. Father Martin's three books on contemplative practice are ones I especially commend to you. They're all published by Oxford University Press. They've come out between 2006 and 2019, Into the Silent Land, A Sunlit Absence, and An Ocean of Light. And Father Martin, in addition to teaching at Villanova, lectures very widely throughout the United States, Great Britain, and the Republic of Ireland, to uh, contemplative groups and monastic communities on the life of prayer. Father Martin, it's wonderful to have you with us this morning. Before I hand over to Father Martin for his presentation, let me also just reintroduce you to Amanda Bourne, who is our technological and theological assistant in the background in these webinars. And just to remind you that uh, if you wish to ask a question, and we hope that you will during the presentation, we will have two pauses during this hour to respond to questions, you simply wake up the bottom of your video screen where you'll see um, on the right hand side a Q&A icon. If you press on that, type your question and your name into the box and then press return to send the question. It will come through to Amanda and she will then be able to um, sort the questions and present them to Father Martin. Um, very glad to mention also that Amanda is now a curate at the Chapel of the Cross in Chapel Hill in North Carolina, but is continuing to assist us in these webinars and indeed to invite some of her own parishioners as audience. Father Martin, let's immediately go to you. Um, and I, I know that you want to speak first about why this apparently obscure person, Evagrius, from the late fourth century is so important for the issue of how thoughts afflict us in prayer and what they mean. Um, and then you're going to expound some of his core teaching for us before we pause to have a few questions. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mother Sarah. Uh, very happy to be uh, with you this morning. Um, I thought first I'll give a bit of a overview of who was this man we call Evagrius. Um, why he is important, especially right now, um, and then some of his most uh, important teaching on dealing with the problem of uh, afflictive thoughts that beset anyone um, but especially those who are trying to deepen their own life of inner silence in the presence of God. Uh, Evagrius uh, is born 344 or 345, uh, reported dead by 382. Um, you notice he's, he, he goes by Evagrius Ponticus or Evagrius of Pontus. Uh, Ponticus isn't his, uh, his surname or his last name. My, my, my students 
think, you know, he's Mr. Ponticus. In, in the, the ancient, ancient world, he didn't have the surnames, last names. You had uh, identified from where you came. So he was born in the region of Pontus. And so he's called uh, Evagrius of Pontus or Ponticus. But we just call him Evagrius. Hmm? Um, he has a very interesting history for our purposes today. He is the embodiment of wisdom, insight, deepened intimacy with, with God by way of career breakdown and colossal failure. He was a close associate of Gregory Nazianzen, who for about a year was Patriarch of Constantinople around 381. And then Gregory Nazianzen had enough sense to get out of the job. Uh, but Evagrius stayed on. He was a very skilled administrator, organizer. And he also liked, he got a bit of a thrill uh, of the ladder climbing possibilities in the ecclesial court in Constantinople. And so he stayed on and um, he had an affair with someone fairly high up in the imperial court in Constantinople. And uh, news was about to break. And he had a dream uh, that he was hauled before a judge and found guilty of um, stealing another man's possession. A wife was a possession. Huh? And um, and then he, he had this conversion in, in his dream that he would sort his life out and so forth. Then he woke up and he felt bound by that dream. That's just a brief, brief uh, sketch. Huh? Um, and he flees Constantinople. He makes his way to Bethlehem to a monastery one, uh, run by a remarkable woman, Melania, the elder, um, uh, the wife of a wealthy Roman senator. And she, after his death, she makes her way to Bethlehem, uh, starts a monastery along with a man named Rufinus, who is famous for having translated the works of the very important earlier theologian origin from his Greek into Latin. And so the two of them, uh, is sort of what later came to be called a double monastery, but she was in charge. Evagrius makes his way there and uh, wants to join the monastery. And she says, well, uh, fine. Uh, uh, um, and Rufinus will take you and show you where to go. He, he also claimed to be very ill or, and wasn't getting any better. And the doctors uh, who attended him went to Melania and said, we, we actually don't think anything is wrong with him at all. And so she paid him a visit and she said, but uh, what, what's up with you? And he, he, told, he told her the whole story of, of, of the, the affair, the, the, the breakdown of his career and careerism um, and all the rest of it. And she said to him, you be, you're welcome to stay in this monastery. But actually, I know a group of monks in the Egyptian desert whom I visited on my way from Rome to Bethlehem. 
I actually think you do better with them. They were called the Long Brothers, uh, apparently known for their height. <laughs> so anyway, and there he went. He, there were other groups, uh, small monastic groups he uh, came to know as well. And in, in a very short time, he, 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 he was the teacher who soon became the master. And this was certainly his insight into human character born out of his own failure. Um, one of the things he's very good at is addressing the problem of thoughts that beset us And so I would like us to look at uh, a couple of texts in which he tells the, he's writing for other monks. Huh? When he tells them, this isn't a question of getting rid of thoughts. It's a question of getting to know them very, very well. So if, Amanda, if you could put up uh, the first uh, chapter 43 from his work, the Practicos. Um, and I'll just go through it a bit by bit, making some observations. We must take care to recognize the different types of demons and take notice of the circumstances of their coming. In fourth century, uh, fourth century psychology was cashed out in the language of demons. The, the demons could not take possession of the depths of the human. This was the domain of Christ. Their role was to keep you ignorance of the divine depths within by keeping your attention riveted to thoughts. Thoughts are parasitic. Their food is our attention. And so Evagrius identifies eight. Uh, and they can team up. Um, they can lie quiet, uh, but they go on the attack when necessary to keep you from praying. He says in, in one of his chapters, this is their chief role. And their chief role, and this is accomplished by the way thoughts, afflictive thoughts, negative, but also he will say even pious holy thoughts uh, steal our attention. And this they gives them their power. So he says, we shall know these thoughts from, we shall know what sorts of demons, but when I say demons, I just mean thoughts. Huh? Um, we need to consider which are the less frequent in their assaults, which are the more vexatious, which are the ones which yield the field more readily and which are more resistant. So you've got to know, you can't be a victim of these things. He wants us to turn the tables on them through awareness or watchfulness, the Greek term uh, nepsis most often, or prosoche, um, watchfulness. So he's, he's not here saying at all, blank them out. Hmm? You want to know them. Hmm? Which of these, let's say, issues for thoughts, which issues are constant for you? Uh, which, uh, which are really problematic, really vexing, uh, or which, which ones are not so much? Say, for example, um, um, anger might be quite an issue for you, and envy might not be so much. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter 
what's important is that you know which they are. And he doesn't say which are the more vexing because we each have different minds. And so we've got to know our own minds, uh, what is going across the screen. Um, if you skip uh, down to the line that begins, uh, now it is essential to understand these matters so that when these various evil thoughts or afflictive thoughts set their own proper force, forces to work, we're in a, we are in a position to address effective words against them. That is to say, those words which correctly characterize the one present. And what he's asking us to do is he, he, he notices what happens. A thought comes across enters our mind and what happens is something within us, he calls it a pathos, a passion is how it's translated, but it's, uh, it's a, a compulsive tendencies in the mind to cling. And when this compulsive tendency within us clings to a thought, an inner narrative is then generated and we watch it, and we watch it, and we watch it. It has a powerful narrative grip. That's the dynamic in which this advice comes. Know what is happening so that we can address effective words against them, the words, those words which correctly characterize the one present. Is, that is to say, oh, this is envy. Oh, this is avarice. Oh, this is anger. This is uh, gluttony, which meant uh, far more than just eating a lot. Um, what this does, when you can see the inner video happening, and be able to say, oh, this is my envy, this is shame, this is whatever. What that does is get you out of the, your attention, out of the storyline, out of the inner video. Because that in us which can see the afflictive thought is free of it. Else we wouldn't see it. So he's cultivating, trying to cultivate um, within us this capacity to shift our, the attention from the storyline, the inner video that goes on in the head that we repeat and repeat. And so here simply to identify it for what it is. Um, it's easier said than done because the, initially they seem as though they're right here. But as our practice deepens, so does um, uh, our ability to see what is going on uh, change. Um, Amanda, if we could have the next uh, chapter, 50. If there is any monk, any person, remember he's, he's talking to monks, but this is, monks are human, so he's talking to their humanity, which we all share, because um, we're all human, huh? If there is anyone who wishes to take the measure of some of the more fierce demons, that is, afflictive thoughts, so as to gain experience in his monastic art, then let him keep careful watch over his thoughts. Notice he's not saying, don't have those thoughts. He says, let that person observe their intensity, 
their periods of decline, follow them as they rise and fall. Note what the complexity, are they, is it just one? Or is, is, it, is it fear and anger combined? Uh, is it uh, envy and avarice teaming up? Uh, how, their periodicity, how often? Uh, their order of succession, do they come one upon the other? Or do they come one at a time? Does one assault you quickly and then back off? Or is it a constant thing? What sets it off? You, you got to know everything about them, not get rid of them. When, uh, and this, uh, the sign of, of deepening is uh, when we are not caught up in the grip of the inner narrative, but for, then just simply saying, oh, this is what this is. To be able to do that, your attention has to be out of the narrative, the inner video. They stay. The less we give our attention to them and our attention being their favorite food, then gorge on our, our attention. Uh, um, they, the less grip, the less gripping power, they even become see-through. What changes is not the facts, fact that thoughts come and go, they do. Our relationship with them changes. Whereas uh, in s early seasons of the life of silent prayer, we're pummeled by them. We're victims of them. And now we become, over time, silent witnesses. And then they become very good teachers and you're, you're deep in your own insight, not only into yourselves, but when other people come and speak with you about their life on the wrestling mat of afflictive thoughts, you understand very well. Uh, yes, M Mother Sarah. So this is a wonderfully psychologically insightful teaching for the fourth century, isn't it? And also quite different from some other teachings about distractions in contemplation, where you feel that the main task is to get rid of them. Yes. But for Evagrius, he realizes that it's not just when we go to pray, but throughout our lives, we have this inner video and in the interstices of our waking and sleeping lives, this video goes on and can control us, right? And so he wants us to understand it and to be able to, as it were, let it carry on without it controlling us. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly right. Liken it somewhat to being addicted to a television. Yes. <laughs> One of these... Uh, uh, <laughs> unreality, reality TV programs. And also the, the thoughts are, maybe people will want to ask this, but the, the eight he identifies are what later became the seven deadly sins in the West, but yes. with one more, which I think is very interesting because it's sadness, isn't it? It's lupe, it's depression. Yeah. Um, um, he, he accounts for that, but, but Yes, by the time of uh, Gregory the Great, uh, who uh, combines some and adds another. Um, but um, uh, so whether, you know, and then the, there are others that aren't on any, uh, a list. You know? uh, but um, um, back to the image of the television, at the beginning, we're completely engrossed in what's on the television set. 
we don't have to get rid of the television set. You simply don't watch it. it, it somehow it's perpetually on, uh, but um, we stop watching it. Uh, it gradually will lose its gripping power on us as we experience perhaps the freedom of not being pummeled. But particularly uh, at this time, I think a lot of us are feeling quite extraordinary surges of anger and sadness at mm -hmm. what is happening in the world. And yes, um, so if you're ready to take some questions, you may find that, um, is that all right, Father Martin? Uh, yeah. We might find that some of these issues immediately come up for people because of our... Yes, and especially in this time, I can say, I think I have uh, 54 seconds. Um, during this time of pandemic, I hear from an increased number of people who either use are using this period to uh, return to deepen their own inner life or are so upset without the usual routines and um, distractions that they're they they experience this as torment these 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 become uh, stronger and they really feel sometimes as though they're drowning gasping for air you know hence the rise in all sorts of things of including suicide you know uh, so there's a whole, whole range of people dealing with the um, with the non-viral aspects of the pandemic. So yes, if there are any questions or... Yeah, we've had, we have actually a lot of questions. Um, so I'm gonna start with one that I think gets at the heart of many of them. Um, so naming these repetitive thoughts seems to be very powerful in combating them. However, many of us struggle to identify our own feelings and or sins. Do you have any resources you would recommend to begin learning about the names of these thoughts that we might be freed from the grip of the inner narrative? It begins with yourself. You're getting to know yourself. Um, sitting in silence and being able to see the difference between a story about fear, a story about anger, a story about uh, our shame, uh, uh, a story about envy, uh, whatever. It's the story line that hijacks us. Um, and it's not a question of reading about it, it's a question of staring it down. <laughs> what is that? And this, especially um, uh, at the, at the, you know, in early seasons of contemplative practice, this is very difficult in people think they're supposed not to have a thought. Well, that is itself a thought. I shouldn't have that thought. <laughs> huh. Oh, I can't have that thought. Oh, he said not to have thoughts. So that's just another thought upon the thought about not having thoughts, you know, so they pile up. But, but if I understand the person's question, it is, it is the person herself who tries to uh, see what these inner narratives are composed of, what thoughts, or is it a, a single thought? And with practice, it can do this. Um, uh, Mother Sarah mentioned the psychological uh, uh, approach, and indeed it is. It's if, if people in the congregation audience uh, are familiar with uh, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy. It uses unknowingly a uh, actually uh, 
a simpler version of this. I, I showed these two chapters to a colleague of mine who is a uh, uh, um, mindful-based cognitive therapy. Uh, and he read these and he said, my goodness, he knows more about my discipline than I do. He simply goes into more uh, detail, not only identifying what are the thought, but how often does it come? What sets it off? Are there certain pressures going on in your life when you're more vulnerable to certain uh, insecurities, um, fears? Um, know the context, the situation. Um, what are those for you? And you do this by telling yourself for a moment to shut up and look. That requires itself a certain stillness. But especially if we think we are when they're in our face and we say, I am my anger. No, anger is present, but you're not that anger. You're a ray of God's own light. But we identify with it. In fact, there's, there's uh, uh, a writer in the uh, named um, Diodicus of Fortique who says, this is actually the result of the fall. We think we are the world of our thoughts. So um, I think I, hopefully I addressed the person's question and I probably talked around it a bit too. Can we have another? Yeah, let's do one more question. Um, so this one um, is asking about sadness um, in Evagoras' list. Um, so why, why would he add sadness? Uh, what does he mean? Um, how does he um, define it? Um, and isn't it just a normal feeling? Um, and in the world we live in today, why shouldn't we feel sadness when we witness so much evil? Yes. Well, this, um, if you get this uh, book, uh, the Practicos is two books in bound together, two works, the Practicos and the second work, Chapters on Prayer, bound together for the sake of convenience. In the Practicos, at the very beginning, he lists uh, these uh, um, thoughts and describes what he means by them. Uh, you have to understand he he's fourth century, so we, we kind of have to update them into our own, you know, uh, sometimes uh, better understanding. But uh, sadness um, will, it does overlap a good bit by what the contemporary term depression can, can cover. So sadness isn't, oh my, I lost the lottery yet again or I didn't get accepted to the school, uh, but it's, uh, it, it, it's deeper and more uh, gripping. And it overlaps also with another that he calls Acadia or Acedia, um, which is difficult to also to translate. Uh, but if you read them in here, it does cover I think what we would use the term depression for, and depression has is different for every person because we all have different minds. So his his sadness is um, covers lots of things. Huh? Um, now is typical. I forget if I answered the question. <laughs> Some people may be puzzled why in a list which later in the West became a list of sins, mm. here has um, something Lupe which doesn't seem to be our fault and can be genetically inherited and so on. This is troubling and fascinating. Also raises the question, if you're actually clinically depressed, um, can this practice 
practice possibly even make you feel worse? Or at what point should you be heading for the doctor's office? I'm sorry to inter intervene here with an extra question, but it may have been part of the original question. Yes. Um, um, there were two things. First, I think it's just a very unfortunate translation. Uh, Gregory the Great would call this a sin. Mm. Uh, in it isn't a nothing's a thought. It's just a, a thought. And he, in fact, uh, you know, he actually Evagrius calls them evil thoughts. I I use afflictive thoughts because mm. they're. If, they give us a hell of a time, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, but it, 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 it does present a lot of problems because people will say, and this has subtly seeped into Christian consciousness, I've had a, a lustful thought, a murderous thought, that is a sin. Mm. If you murder, that's a sin mm. and a crime. But um, um, so I, I don't think that helpful term sin, a thought in itself is morally neutral until it garners through momentum action. And then um, I forgot the, the other aspect, oh, of de de depression. Um, I don't hear often that this brings it on. It might make us aware that we are depressed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody's depression is different. Um, for many, uh, this does relieve some of the symptoms um and works well with uh, talk therapy or psychopharmacological methods of, of treatment uh, but there are people for whom uh, nothing works mm. and nothing takes rid of it that and you know that is the the those people are the people i'm writing for in the last chapter of an ocean of light are uninvited guests, but they had a contemplative practice that could make their uh, life with depression a means of solidarity with other people. This this is a good moment for you to perhaps enter into your last section because I know you want to talk about loneliness and solidarity in that and then we've got a, a, a growing list of questions so the more time we can leave for more questions would be wonderful Father Martin. Uh, yes, um, when one is becomes well rehearsed in this practice uh, with thoughts and, and one, uh, thoughts come and go but you are not your thoughts. This deepens realization. You realize you're the mountain. The thoughts are weather. <laughs> Previously, we thought we were the weather, and so we're <laughs> constantly bounced around. But the mountain, Mount Sinai, Mount Tabor, you are still and can let appear and disappear whatever comes and goes. Um, as this does, this has a decluttering effect, radically decluttering, and opens on to a tremendous inner silence of, well, my way of describing contemplation becoming so still before God that the before drops away. There is no awareness of two separate objects. 
Now, none of this shows up on a CCTV camera, okay? So you, you know, it, it just the, uh, I mean, the numerous examples of tradition who speak about this. Um, when the illusion of separation from God is overcome, what also emerges naturally is compassionate identity with all people. You are also one with all people, as you are one with God, who is one with all people. And so if you could put up that short, Amanda, the short um, um, uh, chapter, 21, uh, 24, uh, a monk is a person who is separated from all and who is united with all. The monks in the Egyptian desert especially lived away, you know, lived um, uh, well in small groups of people, but um, not uh, a, a certain solitude, physical solitude. Hmm? But because of the inner work that the monk is doing, the you, the contemplative, the person of prayer, when a fundamental threshold is negotiated, is crossed, even though you're physically separate from people, you also know you're one with them. <laughs> uh, curiously, and this is just something that is obvious, you, you cannot deny it presents itself in such a way that it's not doubted. And curiously, uh, just and very quickly, uh, quantum uh, physics knows about this with the, uh, if you uh, studied much about uh, quantum entanglement and what's going on there. Entanglement is quite the wrong word, uh, but uh, we're all one with it. In quantum theory, knows how to speak about this, but it's an intuition, well, voiced in scripture, we are one body in one Lord, and in an individual's journey within is at the same time the way out of yourself. And this deeply perceived unity with complete strangers. So if we could look at 125, Amanda, if we could look at chapter 125, I mean, if I was the same, carry along the same lines. A monk is a person who considers himself one with all people because he seems constantly to see himself in everyone. Now, he, he's not doing this in a certain way that uh, the monk is, say, um, a number four on the Enneagram and says, oh, you're a number four too. Or on Myers-Briggs, the INFP, I know INFPs because I am one too and I see it in you and you. No, he's speaking at a much deeper level here. That which is called a self gets in, in silence unselfed of self. And when this happens, the unity of all is the most obvious. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 and this doesn't turn everything into, into a blob. It, it, this unity shines in the glorious particularity of all that is. But what I've called it a, um, just as there's object uh, permanence in as a early childhood developmental stage in, in contemplative uh, realization, a subject permanence. You're not, the, un, uh, the other is unothered and no longer a threat or rival. Right? Any, uh, Thank you, Father Martin. Um, this is a, such an enormous um, importance for our period of isolation from one another when we feel such great grief for being unable to worship Eucharistically together. 
Um, okay, it's a long haul, of course, this path. Mm -hmm. But to have the, the goal set before one of, of an intimacy beyond our current knowing, um, it's wonderfully encouraging. I see a very large number of questions, and we, we'd love, if we may, to take as many as we can in our last 15 minutes. Over to you, Amanda. Sure. Um, so we had a follow-up question about um, what you were saying about sadness and about thoughts, um, about thoughts not necessarily um, being bad if they don't lead to action. There's someone asking about uh, Matthew 5.28 um, and that saying of Jesus where Jesus says, um, anyone who has looked at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So how would you square that? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't earlier? interpret it literally. Mm -hmm. An act of adultery hasn't taken place. What mm -hmm. I think, uh, looking at uh, that uh, pericope from the perspective I've been talking about, was, uh, Jesus is, is showing the power of these thoughts. Mm -hmm and they become so obsessive and steal the attention so much that is, it is as though it has taken place, that we're so caught up in it. But, but, but no, I, and uh, that, that, that uh, you'd be surprised how often that is uh, brought up. Uh, um, and that, but, but but that too, if if if, if we understand that uh, line from scripture literally, um, um, we get an uh, an unhealthy sense of sin. And in um, you know in scriptural exegesis, um, that is that's phrased in such a way as it, it invites a deeper understanding. That if I've thought of, if I've thought of murdering something, someone, I have done it. And that's not what Jesus is getting at. Uh, he getting at other things too. Um, respect for women, women as objects of male obsessive preoccupation so that they're not persons, which legally they weren't in the ancient world. And well... Well, right up anyway to bridal ceremonies. If you pay close attention to a father giving his daughter away because it's his possession, you know, of course, those are lovely, weepy moments, but um, you know, there's other things going on in that text too. Then, then simply if you've had that thought, you it is as though you've done it. But I, you know, think rather he's talking about the dignity of women. I think uh, this may have come up because last week I mentioned the councils of perfection and their yeah. apparent impossibility as being one of the most intriguing point of reflection for the early monks. Um, and here comes Evagrius with a particular interpretation um, through his logismoi, his thoughts. I think it's very fascinating. Yeah, logismoi is Greek for, in for. monastic context, for an afflictive thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah. So we have another question. Um, so this one is asking about um, our own identity. So it seems to me that we often try to understand the particularity of who we are through our thoughts. Once we stop understanding ourselves in terms of these thoughts, what remains of us, of our particularity? What remains is you. <laughs> it's never gone anywhere. <laughs> what the problem is that identity, a sense of identity, has been derived from various labels made up of thoughts. Um, this is why I use the phrase unselfed of self 
a self unselfed of self, of free of the paste up job that um, passes for identity. We are deeper, we, human identity runs deeper than thoughts go. In those listeners who have a mature practice know that in, in these, uh, in the depths, if you will, of, of science, thoughts don't reach. When the attention is snagged by whatever, um, uh, yes, we, we return, but you know that there, there is a depth that the thoughts don't reach. And our self, well, I simply go back to Colossians 3.3, 3. our self is something hidden with Christ in God. Paul doesn't use self, he uses life. I think we can stretch a point. Um, so this that we call a self is forever hidden. Now this doesn't mean, you know, yes, the, this doesn't, it, don't try to use this on Uncle Sam in your uh, tax returns. <laughs> you know, uh, you're not taxing me, I'm hidden with Christ and God. Well, the, you know, so there are various levels uh, that we call ourselves, but increasingly, you know, I am a priest. Well, yes, but that is also a label. I am a theologian. I am Martin. These have certain truth claims, but they're relative. This deepest depth of identity is hidden with Christ and you don't have to find it. It's already shining out your eyes. Should we have, um, it would be nice to have, a, we've got so many wonderful questions coming up. It'd be nice to have, lay a couple before Father Martin and see what he can do with them before the end. Would that be all right, Father Martin? <laughs> yes, quite, yeah. yeah. More than happy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, this question um, is, is sort of implying we're not monks in the desert like Evagrius. Um, so how do we deal with um, what seems to be increasingly manipulative emotional appeals from outside forces mm -hmm. that um, seem to wield a lot of power over our thoughts? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do we deal with distraction in our modern world? Yes, well, you deal with it the way he dealt with it, from within. Uh, what is manipulating me? Who, what cultural forces are trying to define an identity for me? Um, uh, they're very powerful. And let's not presume that uh, a monk is some sort of rarefied other thing or none. Uh, uh, they are, uh, monk means monokos and, and in a certain sense it's, it's just, it's about becoming one person instead of the fragmented um, cells that we lob together as an identity. So we have to, um, uh, there are things that, practical things we can do. For example, um, uh, people who are deeply, uh, throw a set of panic when they turn on the radio and they hear this awful, 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 well, turn it off and just listen to it twice a day. Um, there, there are just, I know someone in his own life, what he had to do was stop for a period of time watching television and reading papers, he said, simply because it made him feel dead. 
there are things that we can do in our lives, and it takes some creativity um, to um, create a protected space for us to live in, insofar uh, as possible. Um, this, in the monastic context, this was called enclosure, <laughs> but enclosure tries to establish a protected space, but enclosure also leads to exposure to that which we would rather not meet within ourselves. But ultimately, <laughs> its ground is God. Thank you. I think you might be able to manage one last question if we're quick. Yeah. Amanda? I was, I was going to come in on the end of that because I think you're beginning to talk about enclosure. And we've had a couple of questions around what seems to be a very much a time of forced enclosure for wow. us in the midst of the pandemic. So how do we manage solitary time for prayer in a time when, for many of us, we're already solitary? Um, and without our normal um, bonds of in-person connection, how, how do we navigate a time in which such solid, so much solitude could lead to depression? Um, yes. Um, now, I think it's important to distinguish isolation from solitude. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of people experience this pandemic as an opportunity for enhanced solitude. Others see it as um, strangling isolation. Um, you have to be creative. Uh, and you have to learn, you know, enforced something. Uh, well, um, don't be passive. Uh, yes, they're there for certain health reasons for this society but uh, try to find ways of making good use of it. Uh, even if it's decluttering your house. Um, um, but yes, of enforced enclosure, um, one can find deep freedom. And what makes it difficult are the inner commentaries that are being made on enclosure or these stay-at-home regulations, uh, uh, all of this, this inner commentary of the mind. So back, back to those chapters 43 and 50 we looked at in Evagrius. What actually is going on in your head? What thoughts are producing the inner commentary? I am like a prisoner. I am forced. Huh? And I, I don't mean to, you know, this is in full awareness that the, the things that your, your livelihood, your business um, is on the rocks. You might be evicted. You know, the, these things are real. There is yet freedom that cannot be taken from you by anybody. And that is covered over by incessant inner commentary on thoughts. Father Martin, I want to thank you so much for this wisdom that you've imparted to us this morning, which is still oddly quite unfamiliar to most church people. Um, Evagrius, I think, really was one of the most psychologically insightful writers in our tradition. And the idea that this time of suffering for us all can be a moment of microcosmic transformation for each of us that brings us closer together rather than separates us is a, is a word of great comfort. And I do thank you for introducing or, us. If I could say, helps us realize that we are already one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not that we have to work to get there. <laughs> thank you, Father Martin. I'm going to end as usual today with a couple of prayers. The first is for those who are suffering and dying in this country at the moment. Let us pray. 
O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray thee to set thy passion, cross, and death between thy judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To thy holy church, peace and concord. And to us sinners, everlasting life and glory, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit livest and reignest one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And then today's Cranmer Collect for Proper Twelve. O God, the protector of all that trust in thee, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us thy mercy, that thou being our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.